Mr. Sanjeev Sharma, who is the Managing Director, Melia Structure Solutions Private Limited. Welcome, sir. So, uh, Melia Structural Solutions is a company specialized in cast in situ and precast structural design services for building and structures. The areas of expertise include residential, hotel, IT, commercial, retail, health, institutional, and stadium buildings, including tall building structures. They provide structural engineering services from concept to production level detailing and are among the top rated precast consultants in India. They use advanced softwares for analysis and 3D BI modeling in their projects, thus optimizing the structural quantity and performance. Today, sir, we'll be talking about selection of uh, right precast system and right connections while planning a precast building from a designer's perspective. So over to you, sir. You can start with your presentation. Thank you. I'm Sanjeev Sharma. I represent Melior Structure Solutions. So I'll be talking on selection of a right precast system and right connections while planning a precast building from a designer's perspective. If you go towards introduction of precast concrete, it consists of uh, concrete that is cast into a specific shape at a location other than its final service position. So as you can see on right on the screen, so it can be cast uh, uh, at a low level. We are talking about selection of right precast system and right connections while planning a precast building from designer's perspective. If we talk about introduction of concrete, uh, precast concrete consists of concrete that is cast into a specific shape, as you can see on the right side on the screen, at a location, uh, at a comfortable location other than its final service position. So the concrete is placed into a form, typically steel, and cured before strip uh, from the form. Now, these components are then transported to construction site on the trailers, erected into place, as you can see, and then the structure is built. So it can be a plant cast or site cast. The benefits are speed, all weather construction, reduced labor, reduced activities, automated process, better quality control, architecturally pleasing, and reduced wastage. So what type of buildings or structures can be made in precast? Almost all that we can think of, like if we categorize residential buildings, uh, tall, low, low rise. So all can be made in precast. So there are some examples on the screen you can see. These are live projects already executed in India. Commercial offices. Uh, I'm pointing currently on the screen. Hotels, institutional buildings, schools, uh, museums, stadiums, car parks, retail buildings, mixed use or shopping malls. And religious buildings like this is a precast Hindu temple. So all the structures you see on the screen are in India. Uh, surprisingly, this Hindu temple, uh, precast in the temple is built in US in Omaha using precast technology. Healthcare buildings, industrial, Airports, bridges, silos, watchtowers, chimneys, boundary walls, cladding, a lot of structures, even other infrastructure projects such as roads, pavements, tunnels, culverts, drains, pipes, uh, almost everything we can do using precast construction methods. A precast uh, plant can be an outdoor plant, as you can see on the screen the crane and the molds. Or it can be a state of the art. Indoor plant using long line pre stressing beds or tables. And uh, these plants can be again uh, semi automatic or fully automatic depending on the technology that we use inside the plant. So uh, we will limit our discussion today towards the uh, selection of the structural system and the connections. If I cut a cross section of the building, I will typically see these following uh, structural elements. I will see a load bearing uh, beam or a spandrel. 
I will see an exterior column. I will see a slab, which can be like hollow core or a solid slab or a double T slab. Interior columns, beams at, uh, if you can see my cursor at point E. Shear walls for stability, like F, and stairs. So these are typically the elements in a structural system. We can use a wide variety of shapes and sizes depending upon the building functionality, architectural intent, and structural performance. So I'll explain further what I mean by architectural intent and structural performance. We start with precast floor comp uh, components, let's say slabs. Uh, so we can have a solid flat slab as a precast system, as you can see on the left here, which can be a solid without any uh, reinforcement projecting out, or it can be with lattice girders projecting out. So uh, we can also have another type of slab, which is hollow core. So these all have a, a range uh, of spans uh, where they are ideal. You know. The uh, for the lower spans, the solid slabs are ideal. You can make it in room size. As the span increases, uh, hollow core slab is pre-stressed slab. Uh, the uh, it becomes more efficient, more viable. And further, when the span increases, double T slabs are a wonderful product which uh, can resist high loads uh, with longer spans. There are some other variations also, like we can have ribbed slabs, either ribs projecting upwards or ribs projecting downwards. These are other small variations, and they can be like non pre stressed or pre stressed. So, uh, how to choose it? Like, if, if we have to do a selection, so normally, uh, if I have uh, spans up to five meter, a solid slab uh, from 75 to 200 millimeter works very well. If I have a larger span, like four meter to 15 meter, uh, without any supporting beam, hollow core slabs uh, works well. And because of the pre-stressing, it, it can limit the reflections uh, and it can uh, take considerable loading in this span range. For higher, further higher span ranges, and if we have the depth, floor to floor height is sufficient enough to allow for the depths, then we go with double T slab. It can span up to 10 to 20 meters. Uh, rib slab, uh, it can also span from 5 to 10 meters, depending on whether you pre stress it or make it non pre stress. So uh, these are broadly the uh, slab uh, flow types. Uh, that can be uh, chosen as a precast structural system and a topping of uh, minimum 50 mm to 75 or 100 mm can be done over it to make it as a composite uh, system so we'll we'll come further when we explain that how from these individual components we combine to make a structural system the another component of uh, floor is beams so beams can be rectangular, can be L-shaped, can be inverted T, can be I-beam, uh, again, depending upon the spans and uh, the uh, usage uh, required. So rectangular beams can be deep or can be shallow, like a band beam, as you can see on a screen, and it can be partially precast with uh, rebars coming out, so you can have a composite uh, action, and also we can have uh, rebar continuity over the support if if required. So these are the rectangular beams. These beams in precast typically have ledges, uh, which are required to support the uh, hollow core uh, or any slab uh, which can uh, rest on it. Uh, L-shaped beam, where we, uh, mainly at the exterior uh, perimeter, where the uh, slabs are required to rest on the one side. I beams for further long spans where you have depths so that uh, cross section is reduced. It reduces the weight, keeping giving you the uh, good amount of uh, uh, lever arms still for the uh, reinforcement and movement capacity. After the floor components, uh, another thing we can do precast are the vertical components like columns. 
uh, which can be rectangular, circular, hexagonal, uh, Y-shaped column, single level, multi-level. So we can make it precast and take it to site and do the connections. Walls also uh, can be done in precast. There's a variety of uh, walls that can be uh, made in precast. We have solid walls. We can have uh, sandwich walls where you have, if you can see here, there's, an, there's a layer of insulation in between here. So uh, that, that gives you the thermal efficiency uh, of, of the building. So typically uh, in very hot or very cold countries, the sandwich uh, walls are a mandatory uh, requirement uh, where you have the insulation rated with some U value. Uh, we can also have uh, different walls based on the texture. Like you can have a fair face. This is a fair face wall. You can have a colored wall uh, like uh, this one. You can uh, pre-color, uh, uh, use a, a pigment uh, in concrete, have it pre-finished, pre-colored. You can have an exposed pattern also like on it. You can, have, you can put a form line. Uh, we can have some retarder and expose the aggregates. We can have a form liner and use any pattern. Um, a very, very nice uh, variety of patterns are available uh, for, as a form liners. And nowadays we can even use graphic textures like these. This, as you can see, uh, image is imprinted on the on the screen. Uh, this project uh, also is uh, taken, uh, is done in India uh, using graphic concrete technology. So we talked about the flows, we talked about the uh, Themes, uh, then the columns and the walls. Uh, then we come to the foundation. So even foundations can be made in precast, um, <coughs> provided uh, they are small and uh, it's practical to uh, limit them to a weight that can be managed. Uh, typically, uh, up to 20, 25 ton can be handled in precast. Uh, more than that becomes a bit difficult. Uh, so. Isolated foundations, tapered or uh, rectangular straight uh, with pocket. Uh, we, in precast, we can use a stiffener type of a footing where we can have uh, large footings with uh, very small uh, bottom depth and we can add stiffeners. So these things are a bit difficult in cast in situ construction because uh, these molds are, are tough to build every time at every location, but in precast, one can make one mold and get many repetitions out of it. And due to that, these odd shapes are very, very economical and possible in precast. Uh, we can have strip footing uh, in un under the walls um, or a normal rectangular footing is very common. It's not possible to do the raft footing in precast uh, though. Coming to other structural components, uh, boundary walls, stadium bleachers, raker beams, stairs and landings, long span roof beams. Uh, so this on the right, you can see this, this uh, I-beam is uh, 55 meter, which is around close to 165 feet. Uh, it's, a, it's an I-beam with the openings for the truss and it's a concrete pretension uh, beam. So we can go very, very long spans uh, for industrial structures using precast uh, technology. Architectural facades uh, with a lot of patterns, and these facades uh, with architectural patterns can be made structural as well. So um, instead of having a different uh, element for the function, just for the functionality purpose or as an envelope, we can convert the same architectural requirement into a structural element by adding a load bearing layer in, uh, at the back and leaving the uh, grooves or patterns uh, or colors or exposures on the front. So uh, the idea was to explain what are the structural elements uh, that are available in precast. So we just saw in the previous slides that a host of structural components, individual components can be made in precast. And uh, now uh, using those individual precast elements, we can use, uh, we can make precast structural systems uh, that can resist the gravity loading, that can resist the lateral loading, and uh, available for a particular type of building. So each building, based on their functionality, will have some particular choice where a particular structural system fits in uh, very well. So if we start with the beam column frame system, so on the right, as you can see, um, in the red, you, we have the columns and uh, beams. So these uh, highlighted ones are the uh, structural frames. So which means that my beam and uh, column are connected well. 
and they form a moment connection and uh, can provide stability. So it's a beam column frame system, although for one or two story, we can have a column cantilevering as well. Um, but as we go taller, uh, cantilever uh, column as a stability is not an option, of course. So uh, for low rise building up to 10, 12 story, a beam column frame system works very well. And uh, they are very suitable for buildings which need a high degree of flexibility and large open spaces without interfering walls. Thus, it is suitable for shopping malls, uh, office buildings, car parks, and industrial buildings. The second system is uh, again using the uh, columns and beams for gravity mainly and using the shear walls for stability. We can call it as an interior shear wall system where I I need an open spaces for, uh, for example, an office building uh, or institutional building. So I can have a column and beam system on the outside and I can have a walls on the inside of the building whereby uh, I, I get the stability of the building and my beam column system can be used for the gravity loading. So here the precast walls are provided at the internal locations and normally we usually have a lift core um, or a central core uh, and these are mainly suitable either for uh, housing, apartments, institutional buildings that are usually taller than beam column frame system when the beam column is not able to give me sufficient stability. So these are some of the examples. Then we have an exterior shear wall system. Uh, it's a reverse of the previous system where uh, so let's say I have lots of walls architecturally uh, planned uh, on the outside, but uh, the inside somehow is uh, without any walls, then structurally we can place the walls, uh, convert the same walls uh, as a structural system uh, which are available on the perimeter. So uh, that is basically to, done to suit uh, architectural and functional requirements. So these walls provide the building stability and also reduce additional structural walls in the interior. So they are suitable for individual housing, apartments, uh, institutional buildings, etc. also. Um, also, you, a lot of uh, shopping malls are done this way um, in some countries. So this one example uh, is there. Uh, the interior is a column and beam, a large span like 15 meters, but exterior is a, is a uh, load bearing uh, wall which gives a stability and has a nice pattern on it. So these this patterns can be uh, done with the help of form liners or different molds uh, in the factory. Uh, then comes a bearing wall system. So a bearing wall system, we have a combination of walls, uh, as you can see on the screen here, uh, inside and outside both directions. Uh, and the slab is directly resting on the walls, so there is no need for any beam or any column. Uh, it helps uh, architecturally uh, for some particular types of buildings like apartments. It helps the architect a lot who doesn't want to see any projections into the rooms. So it maximizes the clear uh, 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 area in the rooms. So uh, they have very high structural stiffness and a pretty good uh, uh, up to 30, 35 story. Uh, this type of uh, structural system works very well. So there are some of the examples. These all examples are real projects done in India itself. Uh, you can see 15 story or a six story, seven story. And this system can be extended up to 30, 35 story easily. Uh, then we have a box cell system becoming very popular off late because uh, it can be fully, uh, even the finishing can be done uh, uh, at the factory and shipped to site. So we have a hybrid system also where you can have precast mixed with steel. Uh, we have a like steel system with uh, a precast slab or vice versa, like we can have uh, precast beams with uh, steel uh, decking and in situ slabs. We can have portal system where we, we have uh, like industrial buildings. I can go large spans up to 30, 35 meter or even 55 meter as I showed in one example earlier. So uh, that was uh, regarding the structural systems and uh, uh, to make those structural systems works, uh, precast connections is very important. Uh, so there's a host uh, variety of connections that we can choose from depending upon again the functionality. So these are this just shows the connection locations. Uh, so we have connections at the floor, we have connections from slab to beam, beam to column, and then from column to foundation. So uh, we, we can have an open system where you have a column beam inside, 
uh, and or we can have evolved system. So each and every system uh, the connection plays a very important role. So we'll cover it one by one. And connections are broadly based on the performance. They're based on two types, uh, emulative and jointed. So there is a in Indian code also. Uh, uh, it says that, you know, IS-13920 that this, uh, the connect the precast is uh, uh, the code is allowed for precast only if the uh, concrete members uh, or the structural system they provide same level of ductility as a monolithic RC structure uh, and even ACI gives the same definition of a uh, emulative connection that they once it is done it behaves same uh, as if they were monolithically cast in place. So it's it's uh, very popular, uh, this type of connections, 90% of the buildings I would say are done using this type of detailing. And the second is the jointed connections where the connections are done locally at few locations and it's a non-emulative detailing and it has a limited ductility. Um, though we have advanced connections, which we will talk in the last, which uh, are jointed but can have uh, much higher ductility also than emulative uh, connections. That's uh, basically a new, uh, a lot of research is going on in that area. We'll talk about for a minute and about that as well. So in emulative, if we talk about which are most commonly used, so we have slab to beam uh, connections with where the topping is there. So we have a uh, uh, solid slab or a hollow core slab sitting on the beams. And typically we have wet, wet fixing connections, uh, rebars are, uh, coming from the beam into the topping. Uh, so this way we can achieve uh, <clears throat> monolithic uh, connectivity, uh, which can uh, simulate the cast and situ type of uh, construction. Next we come to slab to wall. So similarly, we can have uh, you know uh, connectivity from the wall uh, using reinforcement into the topping and connected with the members. So we have solid walls, we can have double walls, uh, this type of uh, connections, we can have uh, uh, emulative detailing. Uh, again, uh, copying the monolithic behavior as if it's, it was a cast and set of building. Also, slab to slab integrity is very important. So we need to have uh, in the joint some reinforcement placed uh, or, or if the slab is working as a diaphragm in case of a shear wall structure, we need to have uh, uh, the reinforcement placed in the in the topping or in the joints accordingly. Um, uh, integrity uh, against accidental actions is very important. So this reinforcement uh, uh, connectivity plays a very important role. Let's say there is a blast or that locally some element failure is there. How to avoid that individual element, you know, uh, making it a, a continuous collapse, how to prevent that. So there is some, as you can see, um, these are the types of uh, failure that can happen in an accident and the detailing is done with the reinforcement uh, in these joints over these areas to prevent uh, this uh, failure as such uh, and we can just make it connected over the joint so that they can just sag and not cause a progressive collapse. Again, if we talk about uh, beam to column joints, uh, they can be like pin joint or a moment joint uh, or if we have a shear wall, we can have a gravity column. So depending upon uh, the performance of the uh, frame system, beam column joints can be designed. So these are some of the options. We can have uh, rebar connectivity. We can have, if it's a simply supported beam, we can have a pin joint. If it's a moment uh, joint, we can have half beams uh, with uh, connectivity of the reinforcement over the joint. Uh, or we can use steel plates to weld it effectively uh, to transfer the moment onto the column. We can have hidden connections. Uh, these are like proprietary items, which, which uh, I'll show again later. More such connections. Uh, after coming beam to column, then we have column to column joint where we can have uh, reinforcement projecting up and a corrugated double tube uh, is there in the upper column. So once this connection is done, it, it works as if the reinforcement uh, is continuous, like in a class and situ column. We can also emulate the couplers uh, by having a special uh, sleeves in precast. Uh, so these are like, they behave like type two couplers and provide direct uh, continuity from reinforcement to reinforcement. So the transfer of force happens through reinforcement to reinforcement. In this particular case on the left, on the right side, it will behave like a lapped joint. So 
the force will go from rebar to the uh, corrugated tube to the column and then to the uh, reinforcement uh, bar there. So in case of tall buildings, uh, it is advised to use the splice leaves, whereas uh, if we are OK with the lab joint, we can have double tube connection as shown on the right. Again, as we come to wall to wall joints, so once there is a uh, lateral force on the buildings, so the individual precast panels, as you can see on the screen, they have a horizontal joint and they have a vertical joint, which will have interface shears generated between them. We need to resist them and we need to provide the connections accordingly. So uh, if we talk about the horizontal joint, uh, in the horizontal joint, we can again use like in columns, a double tube or a splice sleeve. And in the vertical joint, we can have either a rebar projecting out and we, uh, uh, we use a stitch connection or we can use uh, wire loops. Depending on what force is required, we can select the uh, wire loops. And finally, if we come to column to foundation, we can have columns going into the foundation, then uh, have, having pockets there. We can have a pocket footing. We can have pockets, again, uh, sleeves into the foundation, or we can have a rebar projecting up and have sleeves in the column. So all of these connections are possible in column to uh, foundation connections, and uh, they can resist huge amounts of moments, giving you the uh, moment connection at the base. So uh, if you remember, we talked about emulative connections and jointed connections. So what I described uh, just now are all emulative connections. I'll talk about jointed connections. So they are like having a limited ductility because we can have in a wall panel uh, at two or three locations, uh, just a local, Connections. So these are uh, not uh, recommended for tall buildings, but yeah, for low rise buildings where deductibility is not much of a concern. Uh, these are very, very efficiently used. And especially if we have low seismic zones, uh, even up to 10, 15, 20 story, these type of connections have worked pretty well. So as we near uh, completion of the time, allotted time, I will talk uh, about, uh, you know, uh, uh, briefly about the advanced precast connections. So these are like proprietary connections, uh, uh, which uh, are very pleasing uh, visibly. So most of them gets hidden. They are neat, they are fast. So uh, left is a wire loop connection. On the right, we have a hidden corbel here, uh, beam to column. Down left side, we have a delta beam where we have a beam which is, gets hidden into the uh, joint and uh, we don't see it any uh, projections down and there is there is a corbel hidden in the column uh, we don't see any uh, projections there and again we can use bolts like a column shoe there are a lot of companies uh, which manufacture these uh, as a proprietary and they rate it we can just select from them um, the uh, advanced uh, some of the further advances are taking place in uh, high in uh, jointed connections, but making it more and more ductile. So uh, some of these connections are like, if you talk about beam to column connections is by using uh, tendons in place of uh, any corbel or anything. So it has its advantages because it adds flexibility to the joint. And in case we uh, talk about shear wall system, we can have a, uh, a U plate, uh, which is basically in case of excessive earthquake forces. So these dampers, uh, we can call them, they or, or the plates, they get bent and damaged and we can replace them. And the walls are post tension vertically, so they get, they have a lot of elasticity and they have a tendency to come back to its original pos position after the um, major uh, lateral force, uh, in case, let's say in case of an earthquake happens. Uh, the benefit is that if, we, if you compare it with a normal monolithic joint, uh, that joint cracks a lot during lateral load and in high drift. So uh, this is a comparison in the laboratory where this beam column joint is uh, tested to three and a half percent drift. Uh, cracks a lot. Most of the cast and situ structures or precast uh, emulative joints, they would show this type of cracking behavior, uh, not at the serviceability limit, of course, but if the lateral force is at its design limit and the this type of joints uh, where you have a uh, what we talk about in the previous slide where we have a true joint here uh, they don't crack a lot and uh, because of this elastic nature uh, of the tendons um, they can come back to its original position so you can see hardly any cracks is there both up three and a half percent drift 
And similarly for walls, there is a lot of cracking uh, uh, on the emulative wall on the right here, but uh, uh, no cracking in the wall in the uh, hybrid connection, which is press connection. So only some crushing at the toe that can you can strengthen it using some extra uh, steel or some or plates over it. So these are some of the buildings which are done using jointed connections, hybrid connections, and they have worked very well. Uh, Southern Cross Hospital in New Zealand was functional. Even earthquake at Richter scale seven came in New Zealand in 2011. So uh, that's the futuristic connections, I would say. Uh, these are the references I had used building this presentation. And I thank you all for the time uh, that you have given. I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Sanjeevji, for the uh, elaborative presentation. Uh, I would request <laughs> if there are any questions from audience side. Hello, sir. Uh, Hello. My question is, uh, after seeing the presentation, uh, you have shown us the 55 meter span truss. Yeah. Uh, yes. Wanted to know the basic difference from cost perspective, if uh, the same is casted in a steel, means a regular steel structure, PV, PV structure, what is the cost variation as compared to uh, precast concrete? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a good question that what's the cost difference between uh, precast uh, long span structures and uh, steel structures? Uh, so, uh, Although I would say uh, in that particular project, it was very economical to do it in precast uh, because 55 meters was done with just 1.5 meter height, which is very small for 55 meters. And uh, there was no fire paint required because concrete itself offers very good fire resistance. So uh, if you couple that with the, uh, because if you have to make a truss, it would require much more depth that would lose space. You would have to use extra cladding. So overall, uh, it, it came very economical. And for industrial buildings, precast offers very good option and uh, is uh, either equal or uh, giving some savings. And in some cases for the span ranges, if their spans are small, uh, then definitely sometimes pre, uh, steel structure seal cost uh, is more economical. Uh, but in many cases, which the projects with which we are doing currently and the project that I've shown you on screen, precast concrete industrial buildings were much economical. OK, sir. And also the uh, the footing sections which you have shown, the stiffener footing section. So can you yeah. give a more elaborative idea about that particular uh, footing? Yeah, uh, what happens in that footing is, uh, if I go to that slide, is uh, Whenever they're in, for example, in case of industrial building, uh, when you have large overturning movements and not much uh, vertical load to counter it, so there is uh, the size of the footing required is sometimes large, maybe six meter or five meter uh, base. So in that case, uh, your thickness increases a lot because your uh, column from column, the foundation is cantilevering, as in this case, for example, in rectangular build, uh, footings. So as this cantilever increases, the thickness because of the shear force uh, keeps on increasing. So this stiffener uh, are, uh, provides a, the depth and arrests it. And instead of a cantilever, it makes it behave as a three-way slab. So you know that cantilevers are very sensitive to uh, you know, a span. So as we go with the large footing, so this uh, footing uh, which you are seeing currently on screen is five and a half meter by four and a half meter approximately. And it's just 200 base. So if you would do it without uh, stiffness, uh, the depth would be 600, 650 in that range. So you are saving that 400 thickness uh, in, in the footing. OK, and what will be the possible thickness of this stiffness? Uh, 150 mm, that should suffice. Basically, even that is concrete. Yeah, stiffness is also concrete, yeah. yeah. OK, sir. One more question, sir. Uh, sure. In the second last slide, uh, where you have shown the advanced uh, connections, yeah. Between the two walls, there was one U plate, what you have shown. Yeah. Uh, means basically it will act as a damper during an event of an earthquake. Yeah. But uh, coming back to the question of waterproofing of that particular joint, what precaution has to be taken for such a type of joint? Yes, the bottom. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, yeah. These are uh, inside the building, so uh, they obviously no water. So water, any water uh, uh, tightness would be uh, at the source. Like if it's in the perimeter or it's in the roof, it would be uh, done there. So once uh, in the in these buildings, these are architecturally treated uh, openings. So we need to see these uh, plates. We can cover it with a lot of architecture, uh, you know, well, uh, uh, aluminium plate or something. It can be covered it and uh, gelled well with the. Uh, surroundings and only uh, in case uh, we need it to be accessible. Let's say in case of earthquake, you can come and replace this. This is the concept like you have in electricity. Like if there is more current, there is a fuse. So the fuse gets uh, damaged, not the entire circuit. So here again, it's like a fuse. So we are making this uh, plate, uh, sacrificing the plate to take that extra force and get damaged and bent, whereby not damaging the wall. So there's no repair required in the wall. So we need it to be accessible, but yes, you can cover it with a plate or something. Uh, and these are strategically placed uh, locations in the building where it's easily accessible. Thank you. We have a small presentation from our silver sponsor, Dexter India. So I would request uh, Mr. Satish Priyadeshan, Precast Product Line Manager, Dexter India, to come on the stage and deliver his uh, presentation. Thank you for this opportunity. I am uh, Satish Priyadarshan. I am the precast product line manager for Dextra India. This uh, presentation is going to be very brief and uh, thanks for all the speakers who have in depth explained about coupler, its functionality, how it's used, where it's used. So basically all that thing has been done and I would be just giving out references of where it is used. So some of our project references are here. So as in all couplers, couplers are used for rebar connectivity to connect one rebar to the another. So we have a threaded coupler, range of couplers. We have grouted couplers. We have crimped and bolted couplers, which are essentially doing the same thing, providing rebar continuity. So these are all the functions. And uh, you can see this is our precast product line, uh, wherein we have uh, three varieties of coupler. Essentially, a larger variety of grout tech, a smaller variety of grout tech, which is for used for slim sections, and a fully grouted uh, coupler, which is recently introduced. So these are some of our uh, project references. In India, we have uh, done work with Arbindo. This is Galaxy Tower, which is 24-story building. And this is one of our best examples, as in this building, uh, the total construction time was around 11 months only. And uh, this is one more project from Arbindo. This again is a 24-story building. And uh, the coupler being a flexible uh, option, it has also been used to in 2D as well in 3D. So this is a 3D pod uh, uh, which has been done for Suraksha Smart City. And this is a mass housing section uh, which is done in Philippines, a highly seismic area. So in India, the couplers that we manufacture are also exported to India, Middle East, Africa, in US. So it's uh, one solution with multiple codes. And this is a Circo project, a mass housing project in Mumbai, where our project uh, couplers are getting used. And uh, uh, apart from uh, residential and commercial buildings, uh, refineries are one area where coupler uh, is effectively used in pipe support frames. Uh, entire Jamranga refinery, they have been using our couplers for pipe support frames. And this is how the frames look like. Being a heavy precast element, weighing up to 50 or 60 odd tons, uh, this becomes an effective solution. Crowdtech becomes an effective solution. Recently, we have uh, entered the infrastructure uh, uh, project, which is uh, for bridges. The struts uh, which are coming out from the uh, segment is uh, connected with the Crowdtech coupler. This is one odd example. And, uh, when you talk about applications, we are also entering water tanks. So water tanks is getting uh, done in precast, and we have uh, done a few mock-ups for, for water tanks with the uh, grouted coupler. And uh, when we talk about precast, it's all boxes. And uh, this is one rare example where uh, this is a precast building. It's in uh, UAE, and it's uh, done with the grouted coupler. And uh, this is how flexible uh, grouted coupler is. You, you can integrate in any kind of a design and uh, uh, it has it is code compatible so these are all the different uh, these are our customers who have trusted us and given us the opportunity to work with them 
So we are thankful to all these people and uh, thanks once again.